Hello everyone. My name is Ali Imtanan. I am an associate at the Center for Human Rights. And today's panel discussion is on strategic litigation as a way forward for protecting women's marriage rights. And the broader aim, the objective of this session is going to be to discuss the scope of strategic litigation for protecting and advancing women's marriage rights in Pakistan. So beginning with introduce, introduction of a panelist, I would like to introduce first Ms. Sahara Hassan. She is the founder of Imtan Welfare Organization, which works with marginalized communities in Pakistan and runs the Legal Aid Center for issues arising out of statelessness and the assistance in the challenges that people face in the process of acquiring citizenship. She also practices family law and deals with domestic and international adoption cases, custody cases, divorce, and fuller matters, and family settlements. So Sarah, if you could join us on the stage, please. Secondly, we also have national experts joining us from the U.S. First of all, we have Patricia Appy. She is a partner in the law firm of Paris, Appy and Ray, a professional corporation specializing in the practice of family law. Ms. Appy's area of expertise is in complex international interstate family litigation. She has litigated, been qualified as an expert witness and consulted on international family disputes throughout the world, including locations as diverse as the United Kingdom, Brazil, Italy, Pakistan, Turkey, and the UAE. Ms. Appy frequently consults and is regularly qualified as an expert on issues related to the application of religiously based family law systems, including Sharia, Sharia law, Halata, Jewish law, Orthodox Christian denominations, and the application of the Hindu Marriage Act. We also have with us Usama Khawar. He is a practicing lawyer with a decade of experience in research, litigation, and advocacy. He has also been, an act, uh, been active in the academic domain, currently teaching as visiting faculty at Law University of Management Sciences Law School, which is also his alma mater, where he teaches courses on constitutional and criminal law. Mr. Roman holds LLM in international law as well as comparative constitutional law from Columbia Law and Central European University. During his time at Columbia as a Fulbright Scholar, he worked with the United Nations, and his leadership skills and diverse experiences helped him establish Indus Law Advocates and Policy Consultants as a leading law practice in Lahore. Through his practice, Mr. Roman has led efforts towards strategic public interest, in public interest litigation before the High Courts of Pakistan, such as recent litigation for police reforms, jail reforms, curbs on social media and freedom of expression, unconstitutional abolition of local governments in Punjab, and protection of labor rights. In addition, we have with us Vakas Meer, and he is joining us virtually from Lahore. He's a lawyer based in Lahore and is a partner in Access Law Chambers. He holds a master's in law from Harvard Law School, and the bulk of his practice consists of litigation in the areas of constitutional, white collar crime, anti corruption, environmental, and civil law. Bukas has been appointed amicus curiae on six different occasions by the Lahore High Court in matters relating to environment, local government, and others. Bukas also drafted the strategic litigation report in collaboration with the CFSR. A brief overview, a brief context at this point is that this session is built around the strategic litigation report authored in collaboration with Access Law and in partnership with the Center for Human Rights. So Bukas Meer and, and his team led the initiative on this report. We have with us Amy A. Lopez joining virtually from the US. She is an attorney with 20 years of experience advancing gender equity initiatives. Ms. Lopez is an active subject matter expert in gender equity and gender-based violence for the US Department of Justice, Office on Victims of Crime, Office on, Office on Violence Against Women, amongst others. Previously, Ms. Lopez served as a deputy district attorney for Colorado's 8th Judicial District, prosecuting criminal gender-based violence cases in rural and urban jurisdictions. She has a base in communications with a minor in anthropology and women's studies from San Diego State University, a JD from New England School of Law, and a master's in international relations from Harvard. 
Finally, we have with us Father Sayyid Hashmi. He is an American lawyer who completed his LLB from the University of London. He has worked and assisted in pertinent constitutional cases such as the challenge to the Second Amendment Act and the 2022 presidential election. He currently works as an associate attorney at Access Law Chambers, where he assisted in the drafting of the strategic litigation report for the Center for Human Rights. So, beginning right away, I would ask Father to give us some brief insights on the strategic litigation report and particularly on the rationale for selection of specific areas that they have identified for strategic intervention in the report. Hello? Hello? Right. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. I'd like to thank the CFHR as well as Ms. Ari for hosting this event, this conference. It's an honor to uh, speak here, especially among such eminent panelists. So, in drafting the strategic litigation, we looked into several areas of women's rights that could be reformed, where we thought that change could be made. I remember around last year, I was invited to uh, the Government College University for a seminar by the former Chief Justice, Satmika, and he drew my attention to a particular point, that the laws, the legislation of Pakistan lacks in the sense that it is really obsolete, it is old, it is archaic. For example, we quote through the Pakistan Penal Code 1860, the Civil Procedure Code 1908. Some of these laws haven't been reformed, and the same can be said for the situation regarding women's rights, particularly, uh, for example, the Dissolution of Muslim Marriages Act 1939, the Guardian Wards Act. 1890, and finally, the Child Marriage Restraint Act 1929. It is the failure, or rather the uh, reluctance to update this legislation that has led to a huge gap that are, that are women, those women of Pakistan are currently facing. Uh, in analyzing and assessing the areas for reform that we uh, deduced through, through the strategic litigation, we found a few areas that I will briefly uh, walk you over, and then we'll conclude with the area that we thought would be best fit for a strategic litigation uh, report to be issued, and then uh, a writ petition to be filed, uh, soon to be filed before the High Court. Uh, the first area was with regard to the registration of marriages and the role of Nikah registrars. Now, this is mainly governed through the Muslim Law Family Ordinance of 1961. The interesting part here is that the Nikah registrar, he was given a lot of powers, but with insufficient checks and balances, such that he was able to um, change uh, certain uh, statements or certain provisions within the Nikah Nama, perhaps under duress, or perhaps if he's given money by the authority. This also ties into how child marriages occur, in the sense that if someone wishes, wishes to um, present their age as being different to what it actually is, then the Nikah registrar can do that. Secondly, there are no checks and balances as to the Nikah registrar's qualifications. There are no minimal uh, qualifications that Nikah registrar requires. And uh, moreover, these are also not, uh, some of these uh, Nikah namas are also not uh, kept updated with Nadra. Uh, and in, the, in addition to this, there's the issue of polygamy, uh, wherein uh, a husband can, uh, has several different marriages. As per the law, uh, I believe it's section uh, 6 of the Muslim Family Ordinance, uh, the husband is required to ask his wife before he uh, conducts a second marriage. Once again, this ties into the Nikah Registrar, the Union Council as a whole, how if they um, sort of bypass or opt not to uh, take action as to this. Uh, he can very easily conduct multiple marriages without having any checks and balance in that regard as well. Uh, next is the dissolution of marriages as a notice of talaq. Now the law here is particularly um, uneasy in the sense that there was the Gadezi rule uh, established which basically stated that absence of, or rather failure to uh, render a notice to uh, the registrar of the Union Council amounts to revocation of the Nikah. 
after a while, this law was overruled by the Supreme Court, and then it was overruled again. Uh, now, as per report as well, it appears that this law is rather uneasy because the second decision to overrule the Gaddafi Act was by a larger, um, larger bench of the Supreme Court, which would legally overrule the current decision. Uh, so yeah. And finally, we conclude with the child marriages as for the Child Marriage Restraint Act. Now, we thought this was the perfect um, area of law to pursue, mainly with the fact that it's a happening case. Uh, it's immediately involved in this. Uh, the most relevant piece of legislation that's been uh, carried out to update this was with regard to the Sindh Marriage Restraint Act of 2013. Now, the Child Marriage Restraint Act itself prescribes, uh, it defines a child as a male under the age of 18 and a female under the age of 16. Uh, we can see how this is discrimination in nature as well as the 16 age is provided for a girl, whereas the 18 age is provided for a man, a boy, rather. Now, what we aim to introduce is a uniform age prescribed across the board that has the same age of 18 years for both boys and girls. Um, the, initially, there were also further attempts made uh, to amend this act, uh, for example, in KBK uh, in 2014, which did actually increase the age to 18, but the bill was never fully passed owing to opposition. Uh, afterwards, there was also um, uh, there was cases as well that we can consider in this regard that have also further supplemented the issue. For instance, uh, the Mushtaq Ahmed case of 1962. It said that a girl just over the age of 15 was held to be in a valid, valid marriage because she had reached the age of puberty, right? After that, there is another case, 1970, uh, Musanat Bakshi. This case was analyzed as per Muhammadan law, wherein it said that uh, 15 was the age of puberty. Now, if we pay attention to this, we can pay heed to the fact that the answer of puberty is not like um, a definite thing for each and every individual. It varies. And the inconsistency that this creates, the issues that it permits, uh, cause further problems for women across the board. Uh, the last problematic case I'd say in this regard was the Allah Nawaz case of 2013, where the court held that even if the girl is under the age of 16, but she's a in puberty, then she can enter into a valid marriage contract. Uh, now, after this, it appears as though the courts had considered the issue that child marriage uh, prompts. The main shift I would like to refer to is the case of Tahira Bibi, this is SHO, uh, 2020, which depicts the shift of the courts in a new direction. This was a uh, uh, judgment authored by Anwar al Saab, where he noted, and I quote, that child marriages not only restrict women from socioeconomic opportunities, but also affects their reproductive, reproductive health status, such as forced, forced relations, early marriages, complicated pregnancies, a higher fertility rate, and a large family size formation. Child marriages were described as hampering the development of uh, the process of a region of a country Given that a substantial part of human population, women remain uneducated or less educated, unemployed, underprivileged, with poor health measures and no decision-making power. I believe this was a huge pivotal point in the law that shifted the direction of the courts towards acknowledging the greater issues as per the Constitution as well, given how the issue of child marriages tackles uh, or feeds into Article 9, the right to life, Article 14, the inviolability of dignity of man and woman, Article 25, which also uh, affects uh, the right to equality, and 25A, the right to education, as early child marriages also impact, uh, obviously, a woman's right to uh, opportunities and, you know, education. Another fundamental case that I'd like to refer to is that of the Federal Sharia Court. Because one of the main issues when pr prompting such a legislation is that it's met with opposition uh, suggesting that it's against the injunctions of Islam. Now, this, uh, in the case of Farooq Umar Bhoja 
ഇസ്ലാം un-Islamic in some way or manner. Uh, after this, this was also acknowledged by the Islamabad High Court in 2022, once again, showing, depicting the return of the courts towards acknowledging this issue and also, bring, and also showing that, uh, their position to be active and in having a positive perception of bringing about reform, I'd say. Mumtaz Bibi, a 2022 case, uh, the Islamabad High Court, I believe, is by, uh, authored by Justice uh, Farooq Sattar Sahib, Babi, uh, Babi Sattar Sahib. Uh, he says that, uh, the, he says that the court, there, there is no agreement among uh, religious scholars as to what a minimum age of consent is, and thus a case has to be, uh, thus a minimum age has to be promoted and prescribed. So, our whole um, tactic, a strategy in developing this was to was to show the courts how the general shift in the law has uh, is for the benefit of society and the courts direction has also been to uh, develop the law further with regard to child marriages uh, additionally uh, recently uh, india has also taken a positive approach to this there was a case independent court of 9, uh, 2017 where they also held that uh, where uh, intercourse between a man and a woman below the age of 16 would not constitute rape they overruled the decision and said that it could constitute rape so that was also a pin, uh, pin very important decision pertinent decision in citing this so yeah thank you father so before we move further i would like for the benefit of our audience to and i would direct this question to sama to explain what strategic litigation is in pakistan's context how can it be pursued and what grounds are available to any aspiring litigator okay that this is a question that deserves a book on the throne uh but i'll try to briefly uh, uh summarize ke develop it so pakistan in in, in pakistan strategic litigation it primarily uh is uh is borrowed from across the border from the indian side so our developments in strategic litigation they have in one sense mirror the developments in india the only difference between on average what i've seen is being a gap of 10 to 15 years and that is also the gap between the method and also the cases so there's a remarkable similarity that our courts have followed in terms of strategic litigation or what in subcontinent we call public interest litigation and there are also many of those cases the similar sort of rulings they also came with a difference of 10 to uh, 15 years to name a few for example the the uh, on the procedural aspect that on the suo moto or how the court could be approach our seminal cases uh, uh, from from 90s the masi case in india that happened at least from like 10 12 years before it happened in pakistan similarly uh on other issues uh, for example on environmental issue uh shaila zia case in india it happened a lot earlier one of the public interest litigation that i was very extensively involved for 5 7 years that was on uh, stone crushing and occupational health and safety so i initiated in the supreme court of pakistan in 2014 15 in india supreme court of india had done all of that 10 years before that was in like 2002 3 and starting from 2002 so in that sense it has been a, has a gap but with a crucial difference so the uh, genealogy and the roots of 
public and trust litigation in uh, India are much more organic and they also have a lot more progressive, sustained, organized roots. So in India, the founding fathers of public interest litigation were Justice Krishna Ayer and Justice Bhagwati. So if you look at their backgrounds, for example, if you take uh, Justice Krishna Ayer, who ultimately became uh, the Justice of Indian Supreme Court, uh, and authored many of these seminal judgments on public interest and trust litigation, both on the methodology and the substantive aspects. So he was uh, back in 50s and 60s in southern India, uh, an organizer and a lawyer for uh, legal aid movement. He was one of the founding fathers of legal, legal aid movement in India. And then he was all, then he also became a legislator uh, from, if I am correct, from Communist Party of India, uh, Communist Party Marxist of India, and he was a state legislator. And ultimately, then he was elevated to the High Court and then made it to Supreme Court. So he and he was not alone. There was a sustained movement on the root slide, were much more indigenous roots, and the roots were in the legal aid movement. And that is why once you see that once it matured ultimately in 80s after the imposition of emergency in India, uh, late 70s and 80s by Indira Gandhi, that's when it, it came to be a very mature sort of development in Indian jurisprudence. Uh, so, so, but in our, they were selective borrowings as one of the scholars in this field, Mariam Khan calls it selective borrowings. And those borrowings were not were very haphazard. Uh, so that is one from 90s to let's say to 2005. That is one period if we are to describe periodization of strategic litigation in Pakistan. So 90s to 2005, and then 2005 to 2009. That's another period. That's if the Khasha period. If the Khasha period is 2005 to 2013. Uh, and it, it is divided into pre lawyers movement and post lawyers movement. Uh, many scholars, people who look at uh, civil military conflict and generally uh, the developments and they think that perhaps strategic litigation or public interest litigation proved to be one of the main uh, contributing factors in the lawyers movement and ultimate firstly removal of its Fakhar or the subsequent restoration. So, and then after the restoration, we see this, in one sense, one can say the golden period of public interest litigation. Uh, Chaudhary Saab and Supreme Court exploded uh, with public interest litigation, and there have been studies uh, showing one of the barometers uh, is to see the Suomoto. Uh, so, Suomoto in a, technically is not strategic litigation. So motto the court for the most part is taking a notice on its own. But in Pakistan it has come to be conflated and for some good reasons public interest litigation, strategic litigation, so motto all of them uh, by and large in, they fall under 184 3 article of the constitution and for high courts if you have this 199 which in some sense has an limited scope procedurally, but substantively is perhaps uh, a much wider and more richer clause than perhaps 184.3. So that's another period. Uh, and post the Fakhar Chaudhary, there was some cooling off period and uh, once new chief justices came in. But then we also see a second explosion and that is uh, in the period of uh, Sakim Nisar, Chief Justice Sakim Nisar, uh, uh, that, that's another period. So in Pakistan, uh, and now we go back to that, that, and where we are, as Sahira would later also speak about it, and I also share, so we were the enthusiastic supporters of public interest litigation, strategic litigation. In fact, I, to be honest, became a lawyer because of public interest litigations and, you know, while we were in schools, planning what to do with our lives, we saw this lawyer's movement and were very, very enthusiastic about the potential, the creative 
liberatory and progressive potential of public interest litigation. But we have been forced after 10, 12 years of uh, what has happened in the name of public interest litigation in, in Pakistan, especially the period from 2000, late 2016 to 18, 19, and that is primarily the Chief Justiceship of uh, Saqib Nassar. That has also shown what we call the dark side of the moon, the other side of the, the d destructive potential of public interest litigation and heightened judicial review, uh, and and what it can do to fledging democracies like Pakistan. Uh, but uh, so so that's and uh, all of us we are uh, the, the the events are recent enough to. S that we know what was happening in the name of public interest litigation, the sewer motors, uh, like three, four years ago. Uh, but there's also a note of caution that perhaps something similar can happen uh, in the coming period also, uh, considering that the, the man who's going to be in charge. And that brings us to another issue that in Pakistan, it is very, very, and this critique applies across many actors in the public interest litigation in this arena, that it is individual driven litigation, which again is very different from public interest litigation in India, uh, South Africa, and then strategic litigation where the, originally the term and the, perhaps the concept developed that is U USA. So in USA, strategic interest litigation, what they call, and then uh, South Africa or India, there have been indigenous organizations, political activity around it. Uh, there were organizations, political parties, marginalized groups uh, working in, in communities at the grassroots level, uh, dealing with very real concrete issues. Uh, and then this was, so this is also something very important. That, the, that their reliance on public interest litigation or these strategic litigation was, as the name itself, was strategic reliance. This was not the end. This was one of their tools. So in their struggles for emancipation and for a more just and progressive world, this was one, one of their tools. This was not the tool. What they always understood, and many of them tried to practice, that they did not see law as the ultimate emancipator. The law was supposed to, and courts were supposed to be as one of the one of the tools in USA in the struggle for uh, against anti-black laws, uh, for human equality. But it was not a substitute for political struggles, for community organizations. And they saw it for the most part. Uh, and India similarly. But in our context, uh, due to sort of radical depoliticization, what I would call. So in Pakistan, we were also unlucky that we saw the birth of this pheno phenomenon right afterwards in, in the last years of Zawl Haq. So we were coming out of this extreme oppression where politics was frowned upon, politics became synonymous with fraud and deceit. And it is found still in our vocabularies that if someone is trying to cheat, you say, with a siyasat So this is what politics ultimately became synonymous with. And so some of those, the larger societal and political trends, they also seeped into our public interest litigations in the 90s. Uh, it was anti-political, politics perhaps was also absent from it. It also, to some extent, uh, NGOs or non-profits became the leaders in it. Uh, in grassroots, genuine sort of political engagement was lacking in it. Uh, so it became more sort of individualized and also not just, so as I said, in Pakistan, it was very individual driven exercise. One, the litigants do the judges and, and the structure also sort of encourages this. 
far court say interpreted that it is ultimately the chief justice for example who can take a suo moto notice so it was one man driven thing so it depends who is the chief justice the next guy comes he's like very polite or you know he doesn't want to do this thing and the entire system comes to a halt uh, they just dispose of cases or never take up those cases so this is this goes against the very essence of law rule of law and one of the defining features of law is consistency the consistency in not only in substance but also in practice so b uh, it became individualized and very individual centric from the litigant side from the judicial side uh, and 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 subsequently what we saw and it gave too much power to the judges so it depends what the judge sub likes so for example uh, one of the public interest litigation and there is a team of mint and meta i see here and i was fortunate also be to involved at the very initial stage of it uh, the kachi abadi litigation so imagine the kachi abadi in islamabad they were demolished and 12000 people made homeless within one night and um, at least 2 lakh were slated for uh, homelessness in islamabad in a public interest litigation so it also became reactionary and and this and that is primarily due to the fact that it was very individual driven and a particular judge of the high court thought it was in public interest so it gave too much power to the judges so we relax the rules of standing local standi what we call uh gave too much power to the judges uh in the uh, local standi the relaxation in the rules of local standi was meant to facilitate uh and to empower people who were generally generally excluded but ultimately what ended up also becoming that the litigants and the communities they ended up losing control over the litigation and the purposes for the, for which they came so for example uh in this kachi abadi case the original person came to get a cnic for himself and perhaps for the members of his community but ultimately the court in his petition uh ended up ordering homelessness of 12000 people who were demolished in one night and several other 44 kachi abadi were also slated to be demolished and the person kept crying that look i just wanted a cnic i don't want you to hear my case but the court was like no 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 we have we have seized this moment and seized this public interest litigation so in the sense our history there are uh, parallels with india for where we have borrowed but there are also key differences and uh, in a society in 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 a democracy and in a polity with this absence of politics organized politics this tool which was meant to be emancipatory uh was meant to be progressive can be hijacked uh due to the fact that there is no organized politics around it and then it also can be proved to be very counterproductive that sometimes it becomes a tool of uh what what, what you would say uh just taking the gas or, or the momentum out of these organization uh, organizing communities who are organizing and rallying behind certain uh, objective political objectives on and so forth uh, but i'm sure tahira would be able to uh, <laughs> from uh, especially in karachi this also has been uh, some interesting public in- interest litigation has been done thank you sama So you touched upon Article 199, which really is the modus operandi for pursuing strategic litigation in Pakistan. So I have a two-pronged follow-up question for you, Mr. Tahira. That could you, for the benefit of non-lawyers, uh, break down the contours of Article 199 and what sort of rights can be pursued through it? And secondly, what significance does it carry for women's marriage rights in particular? Yeah, I think uh, you know there's been a lot of uh, academic discussion, and I think uh, the direction that I would want this conversation to take at this moment is what we expect out of strategic litigation, and what the reality is at the end of the day, and maybe we can explain 
Um, so coming to that, I think, you know, in my experience, obviously you have strategic litigation is meant to change things. It's meant to challenge uh, existing norms. It's meant to lay down principles where there are gaps. It's meant to empower those that are not empowered. And that is academically and theoretically the gist of what strategic litigation for us is. Um, the uh, when you go down to the grassroots level of course there are two ways of doing it one is public interest litigation where you have uh, organizations or groups of people and then you have individual litigation now not to undermine the developments that have happened here i think a lot of uh, changes happened in terms of child marriages there has been uh, you know there's case law there there's principles in terms of family cases also there has been a lot of development where principles have been laid down for example for travel for women which children in custody cases, for other uh, cases of that nature, for, you know, for example, women can't, uh, if they get remarried, they can't keep their children, used to be a question mark, that has clearly been dealt with. Um, however, there is, for me, the very important component of what do these principles, what are they meant to do? They're meant to empower. Now, there is no filter down process. There is a huge distrust of courts and of the judicial system. Uh, the common man is not willing to go and engage with litigation and courts. Uh, and that filter down process, so basically what you are doing is that we do have principles, they are set in our judgments, we do have access to uh, different kinds of relief that might be there, but how is the litigant benefiting and how are they being empowered? So I think strategic litigation cannot be looked at in isolation. So you can have cases, you can make uh, changes in law, you can have judgments that in fact you can have uh, uh, you know, women's marriage rights that are being enforced to court, but how is that empowering the person who is wrong? And how is it changing their reality? So strategic litigation would be, in my opinion, one component of a much larger picture in which we have to talk about advocacy, uh, policy changes, uh, and community engagement. Because without the awareness of the rights that strategic litigation is ultimately giving us, there is no point of those rights existing for us. So I think the, the fact that there is a fear of uh, the judicial system, there is a fear of the judicial system being anti-poor, because I think that is the main, the main challenge lies there when you have people who are uneducated, unaware of their rights, not being able to um, access justice and to be able to go to court, that strategic litigation in a vacuum becomes irrelevant in practical terms because it is not impacting and filtering down to the communities that actually need the empowerment, be it with women's rights, be it in any kind of other form. Um, I work with communities, uh, I work in slums in Karachi, and we work on identity and citizenship issues. Now, when uh, Sam has also talked about, uh, you know, strategic litigation and the power that one person holds to be able to make those judgments. And there is a huge fear of accessing court. There is a huge fear because there are multiple things that come into play when these uh, uh, judgments are being given or these cases are being argued. So one of the key things that we often recommend is that there are alternative modes of agitating your rights. And once those are exhausted, and only once those are exhausted, should you opt for strategic litigation in case of something that can be controversial, you have at the political environment, you have to look at uh, the issues that you are taking to court, you have to on balance see whether it is something that would have, a, I mean public opinion matters a lot also, what kind of, uh, you know, uh, drawback would there be as far as public opinion is concerned. I'll give you an example. I mean, we've been talking about adoption laws for a very, very long time. And uh, to my mind, it's a no-brainer. There's adoption happening in Pakistan all the time. It is not uh, un-Islamic by any means, but we do not have law to facilitate that. So, and the fact that you want to talk about it, then you say, okay, it's better not to touch it, because at least currently under guardianship proceedings, we have things that are happening. The moment you start highlighting 
if you miss your alphabet, there is going to be a backlash and it's not going to happen, which puts at jeopardy the things that are actually happening. So I think in theory, strategic mitigation is, I mean, the principles need to be laid down, changes need to happen, reform needs to happen, but we have to really look at the grassroots level impact of, uh, of these uh, changes that do happen. So I think that's really, really important from my perspective. Sorry, I didn't answer your question. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Sara. And Sama, before we move on to our international experts, could we just briefly talk about Article 119's relevance to strategic litigation? So, uh, our, for the benefit of our international experts and uh, some of the law students here, so the way our, our courts are structured, is in one sense three tier hierarchy. Uh, Supreme Court at the top, and then there are the provincial high courts, and also federal territory Islamabad high court, and then there there are sub subordinate courts. Uh, what is there's also a federalist a federalism aspect to this hierarchy, and in theory, high courts are in one sense are equivalent to what in US we have the uh, state's supreme courts and high courts have much more, uh, many more powers compared to supreme court in certain aspects and and one of one of the aspects in, in which they are, uh, two as aspects in which they are, A, that the provincial high co uh, provincial courts, subordinate courts and there are plethora of courts in every province, they are all sub subordinate to the high court and high court is their administrative head, so on and so forth and that has consequences that how justice is administered. Uh, it has consequences for the protection of rights. But most importantly for our discussion, it is primarily under Article 199. It, uh, it is the duty of the high courts. They are the primary one sense judicial guardians of fundamental rights. So uh, in our constitutional structure, there's a chapter on fundamental rights that are judicially enforceable. And then there are principles of policy that are not judicial enforcement. So primarily it is the high court's duty to safeguard the uh, fundamental rights from the executive's encroachment, uh, from state's encroachment, so on and so forth. Uh, and, and high courts have, over the period of time, they also have relaxed certain uh, uh, what 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 you would, what would say the rules of standing, local standing procedure requirements, uh, and and their paths are have come to be very similar uh, to judicial interpretations to what the Supreme Court exercises, but with one exception that the Supreme Court has carved out this almost new jurisdiction of suomoto for itself, and the High Court seven. But in in practice, it does not make much of a difference. Uh, the way system functions, if a high court judge is interested in a certain subject, as we said, it's very individualized. You can ask anyone to file a petition, bring a petition, and and technically, the Supreme Court should also not take sumo motors. Even in in fact, in no circumstance, they should. Because uh, we, as it's often pointed out, there are a very litig litigious society and there are litigations on every topic under the sun. There are petitions. So there's no need for Supreme Court or for any court to have a suo moto because it also results in certain other forms of injustices or what we also have a tendency to get carried away, uh, go in direction. So to recap, under, un, uh, under Article 199, it is the primarily obligation of the high courts. And in, our, in my personal experience, uh, most of the time for public interest litigation and strategic litigation, high courts compared to Supreme Court, are a much better forum 
But I would also have, and I've been thinking, and one of our stars in public interest litigations, uh, I started off with, I practiced with two uh, Mintos, Abed Asan Minto and his son Bilal Minto. They have been emphasizing and discussing it for many, many years, the need to go to the actual subordinate courts, what we call, uh, have penal penalties imposed, let's say, for habeas in the civil nature. So unfortunately, uh, in our in our Pakistani context and to a large extent in India also, that due to the fact that there is a direct provision for going to the High Court and the constitutional jurisdiction, the actual wheels of justice have not been oiled very much and those are the civil courts, the subordinate courts, there are so many courts and there hasn't been done because in, uh, theoretically they also can assume constitutional jurisdiction and they can be sued filed for the vindications of constitutional rights. There is no bar as such. But if you ask many lawyers and law students, in fact, uh, they, they wouldn't believe and they would not know that you can actually approach a civil court for the vindication of your constitutional rights, uh, so on and so forth. Thank you, Sama. Moving on to our international experts, I would like to invite Ms. Lopez to share some key considerations for developing women's rights related to peace litigation. Thank you so much. It was wonderful to be with you all. It is about four in the morning for me, so bear with me as I sip my coffee. But this is a really exciting space to be in community with you all and to see what's happening there in Pakistan. So as indicated, the bulk of the cases that I work on um, involve gender-based violence. So particularly in family law cases, all of my clients are survivors and or victims of domestic and sexual violence within the context of their marriage. Um, so some of the strategic litigation that I work on is certainly challenging foundational law in the U.S. that doesn't account for or protect uh, human rights and freedom from violence. But I will say to some of the comments that have already been made, I really appreciate this concept of thinking about strategic litigation in terms of grassroots partnership. And frankly, that's 90% of what I do at this point. So to give an example, we have a pretty significant body of law in the U.S. about human rights, anti-violence within the context of marriage. But the way in which it's applied in actuality in the courts is not always equitable, particularly in a gendered perspective. So what we do a lot is work with our local uh, domestic violence shelters, universities, folks who are actually working with survivors of violence to say, how is this being applied um, in people's lives? And so I'll give uh, an example that is, as Patricia might know, very American. Um, in the U.S., when a protection order is entered against an abusive party, the court is required to ensure that that person does not have guns because of safety, right? In reality, in some of my rural communities, the court has decided on their own to say, well, I'm going to issue this protection order, but I'm not going to require the abusive party to relinquish weapons because we're in a small potentially impoverished community, and this family hunts and relies on the food that they get from hunting to feed themselves, children, and some other economic impacts. The court's intentionality there is thinking about the family, about the kids, about some of the socioeconomic factors. But when you work in gender-based violence, that's a terrifying uh, proposition for a court to be making that decision without really understanding the dynamics of domestic violence. So I think in terms of strategic litigation, therefore, we're not just challenging the court's inability to apply a law correctly. We're also pulling in our grassroots partners to say, what are you actually seeing in your community? So how can we sort of step in and and help appropriately. And the other comment I would just make is with all strategic litigation for attorneys 
We're trying to build a body of law, which means several cases that we can then take up to the next level of court, at least here in the U.S., to say, look at how this law is failing or advancing a certain initiative or not necessarily being um, effective as it's designed. If you're doing that, because these are people, right? These are actually people who are experiencing um, the harms potentially that's coming out of the existing, existing law. So just to circle back on what some of the panelists have said, having that holistic team where you have other support systems to help your clients as these cases are being litigated is really important. Um, again, because for me, I might look at a case and go, wow, this is actually everything I need to change some part of this law or to raise public awareness about this. But in the meantime, this is a survivor, right? Trying to sort of work through an inequitable system and how can I support them as we advance our legal initiatives. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Lopez. Moving on, Ms. Abby, I would like you to share some insights on possible challenges and ways forward that can be taken for pursuing strategic litigation of women's rights. Well, first of all, um, I'm delighted to have been invited to participate, and I truly wish I was with you um, in person. Is that I cannot stress strongly enough how important this particular conference is and how important the law of Pakistan is to the application of these concepts throughout the world. Um, one of the issues that I'm sure you're all aware of is that because a great deal of Pakistan family law um, is empowered by nationality jurisdiction, applying to Pakistani nationals around the world, the elements of the law that are determined here have effect um, in the case law that we litigate, for example, in the United States and that I, I have um, had to address in the United States litigation. So the very first thing I'd say is that, that all of what is happening here is not just for the benefit of uh, Pakistani women um, and, and children within Pakistan itself that has a much broader um, uh, impact and, and much broader effect. Um, I also say that there is no area of litigation that has more challenges in strategic um, issue litigation than senior law. By definition, uh, most of that is, as our colleagues indicated, individual litigation. Um, there are particular fact patterns. They are related to the application of a particular family um, circumstances. The other difficulty, cultural difficulty, that occurs, and may have been alluded to earlier, is that uh, there are, are very few places in which there is such a strong culture of privacy with regards to domestic issues and with regards to, to an aversion to litigating um, any private um, domestic issue, whether it's the dissolution of the marriage and the circumstances of dissolution, whether it's the, the elements of, of a marital contract. And that, those, com that, those factors together with strategic litigation of some of these issues um, extremely challenging to be able to focus those issues um, in a way that um, addresses a broader um, concept or a broader legal premise. I would like to, to indicate that there there are some things that I identified very briefly in the um, outline and the comments that have been made. By the way, the materials are exceptional, and um, they will continue to provide um, extraordinary guidance in this regard. The, the issue of uh, the uh, Nepal registrars and, and the issue of uh, the Nipahama, uh, particularly official forum, I can't express strongly enough how important this is in, in its application and its use um, of litigation that I've seen not just in uh, the United States, but in other countries. One of the difficulties that I see, and, and it's been identified in, in some of the written materials, is the aversion that 
that the individual um, driving dreams the families have and actually um, negotiating and putting oh, and putting forward have I been lost? Um, I don't know. No. Um, um, hopefully you can hear me. I hope. Thank you. A little bit of a problem there. Um, the the difficulties that that um, one has in families um, actually enabling their daughters um, or or women feeling um, empowered to apply the existing ability to negotiate a um, marital contract that reflects and reserves their rights, um, which they're entirely able to do under the law, and which provides enforcement mechanisms in the event that those reserved rights are not respected. I would suggest um, that, if, that as part of the concept of strategic litigation and um, advocacy in this regard, that having a um, the official form, and I know this sounds very pedestrian and, and very um, simple, but having on the form, it, rather than just blanks, boxes that would enumerate reserved rights that are regularly contemplated and supported under Islamic law would be huge in this process. For example, having a box that indicated um, that the, there was a delegated right in the, the uh, bride to be able to um, declare divorce on behalf of her, on behalf of herself, frankly, um, the delegated right of her husband. That element alone would enhance dramatically um, the opportunities and the power that women would have within of these concepts. The same with issues regarding um, the representation of the amount of mayor, the amount of um, financial support that is, is to be provided in the event of a divorce or in the event of a death. Um, the, the element of having this process um, normalized and not leaving it to individual families to negotiate, particularly they who do not have access to um, legal services before the marriage takes place, and where some of the issues that have been identified, cultural and otherwise, um, create significant uh, limitations. That's a practical issue, but it also implicates um, administrative issues that go to quality and go to making sure that um, the administrative processes um, are applied equally and are applied um, in ways that are contemplated under the statute. I would uh, note that in litigation that I've been involved with recently, there has been an increased number of cases in which um, legal registrars have um, assisted the families in uh, modifying what had been their intended content and suggested to them, for example, that certain things would not have to be in the um, marital contract because everybody understands that this would never happen to this family. Or um, everyone understands you don't have to put down the amount of financial support in the event of a divorce because the courts would figure that out in the very unlikely event that a divorce were to occur. Um, these are, are may seem pedestrian, but when you, when you go to the issue of, of litigation, and you go to um, fleshing out where the difficulties are, it is very often providing very practical and very um, uh, simple uh, mechanisms in order to enable those to have cover, if you will, for being able to say, well, you know, I think that that's something that I would want to do. I also have, I have to say how helpful it has been to have a national registrar and a national mechanism of being able to confirm the status of the validity of marriage and um, and the the I would I would assert that one of the things that could help in being able to assure that registrars are not engaging in um, intervening or uh, providing um, influence where they should not be 
would be to provide the ability of the marital parties to have the, the official um, uh, national record returned to them for potential correction or review within, let's say, a 30-day period, which would allow um, a woman to see that something that she thought was in a contract um, had been extracted as one of the issues that was raised. Um, finally, I would just, um, in these preliminary remarks, suggest that um, looking at um, the issues of border control and its relationship to um, the, the use of Talak um, is an important um, area of concern that was not mentioned that, that I would suggest. In a case that was litigated in the United States, um, what, this is, I've seen this device used a number of times in a number of places in Pakistan, and that is a wife um, a mother is, is suggested to um, go to visit her family. Um, while she does that, um, her husband travels with her, pronounces Talak while she is in Pakistan, and then he um, closes the border, um, puts her on the um, exit control list, and he needs some help. She is trapped, um, thereby ensuring that she does not, she's not able to uh, seek recourse from any court outside of Pakistan. And I'm referring now, of course, to parties that are, are primarily reset, resident outside of Pakistan. And he is able, on the other hand, to leave and, um, and go about his business while leaving her in the position of um, being trapped and not being able to, to seek recourse, perhaps in a place of superior jurisdiction as it may uh, address um, some of the disputed issues. Um, the, my, my final thought is, um, I think that the co a combination of discussion of when there are cases that, as we would say, are capable of repetition but evade our review, when there are, there are situations in which there are issues that would give rise to appellate review or writ practice before the high court. Um, seeing those, communicating about those from, on the level of the NGO, um, providing access to um, uh, statutory review, not only within with experts from within Pakistan, but understanding that a whole host of Pakistani nationals um, are affected um, wherever they live on the globe. Those are my thoughts. I'd just like to add to that. I mean, one of the important things that comes to mind uh, when we're dealing with issues of this nature is the lack of uh, protection systems. Now, if you are meant to, you have the legislation, you have uh, you know, litigation principles in place, how do you go about agitating those rights and what kind of facilities do you have that give you protection to be able to do that? I mean, we have uh, domestic violence laws and if I look at the cases that come to me of, of divorce and separation, you will find maybe 0.01% people who are willing to agitate those laws. We've been getting very good judgments in Spain in domestic violence cases. There have been fantastic you know, uh, grounds made there but people are not willing to agitate that or uh, go down that road. What's the reason for that? The reason, I mean, the primary reason, of course, is the social and the cultural barriers. So it becomes an issue of, oh, maybe this is not the right thing to do. Uh, why should we be uh, taking our personal matters into public spaces? And that is the mindset that needs to change. It does not matter how much strategic litigation we do, what kind of principles we get laid down, until and unless we don't empower the woman and give her protection systems. If I am in an abusive relationship in my house, there is no place for me to remove myself and go to. Where do I go? There are two and a half shelters in a city as huge as Karachi. There may be two and a half in Lahore. There are no systems that give women protection or safe spaces. As a result of which, and especially women who are, and, and this is across class, by the way. It is not that people who are in underprivileged communities are in a different situation and people who are in uh, belonging to affluent homes are in different situations. The economic control, economic empowerment is number one. Number two, no space to go. 
That is very important. Shelters are not equipped to deal with women and children both. There are very few that take both in to give them protection. And until and unless we don't have these protection systems in place, all other rights that are granted to us are completely ground zero. Because we, without these, are unable to agitate the rights that are given to us. So I think the coming, rounding back to the same point that we started off with, that strategic litigation is one part of a bigger picture. And all the other dots have to connect to be able to implement and give us relief on ground as women agitating our rights and fighting for our rights. Thank you, Ms. Afi and Ms. Hassan. Some very pertinent points raised there. My final question before we move on to the question and answer session is, how important is timing for successful strategic litigation? And are there any certain times or contexts where strategic litigation should be avoided? This question is open to all panelists. Anyone who would like to volunteer with us? Um, timing, I think, is key. I think a lot of times uh, you have to be aware of there's multiple factors that come into play. Of course, your political environment. Uh, the, I mean, coming back to what Osama said about who's in the position of decision making. What kind of mindset do they have? What kind of uh, judgments or what kind of attitude has been displayed over the course of different kinds of things? Uh, and can you agitate your rights? Because sometimes it becomes completely detrimental to go for strategic litigation because the outcome can be something that takes away even what you currently do have. So I think to weigh that out, you have to make sure that after evaluating, there has to be a evaluation on all components before you go for strategic litigation. Dealing with citizenship and identity issues, which are very controversial and we do not get relief uh, generally um, at, at the superior court levels, I think you know one of the things that we propagate is that uh, use every other form of advocacy to be able to resolve your issue. And litigation should come when the time is right. Because if you litigate on something that is really important and it goes south, then you're going to be deprived of rights that you could have gotten through other methods of advocacy. So we heavily advocate uh, different kinds of interventions where you can be on an individual level or collectively as a group uh, agitating your rights. Uh, it's amusing that you timing. Uh, you asked question about timing. I was before coming on uh, the stage, Sahara and I, we were talking about typing. So I was telling her, so I have this client, who uh, the field to Sahara ki have uh, stateless communities, ki, but, but one of the clients I'm dealing with, a very young, energetic uh, tailor, a Afghan refugee, and he was born here. His father was in fact born here, the third generation of Afghan refugees. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, and under the law, uh, citizenship laws, he's perhaps entitled to citizenship. And I have been in touch and he, uh, after a year or two, comes to my office and precisely asks his questions. So I remember first time I uh, he got in touch, that was back in 2018-19. Um, and I was like, timing is not uh, you know, milit civil military, Afghanistan, and you know, the loss of Afghan refugees. The, and uh, at that time, there was also this hybrid regime experiment at its full swing. So I was like, hmm, Lahore High Court pain, where these cases are going, what is happening to loss of these public interest litigation, so timing is not right. And he was like, okay, I I'll wait. And after six years, it's like, yeah. is timing better now? I'm like, no, no, timing a BB thik. And now it has become a ritual after every six months, he calls and messages. And the only thing is, the only question he asks is, sir, is time right now? And I've been, for the last four or five years, I have been telling him, you know, time is not right yet. So uh, the moral of this story is, as I said earlier, if the litigation, public interest or strategic litigation, is not uh, rooted, it, it does not have deeper roots, 
uh, then the issue of timing becomes more important. Uh, so, and it also takes away from some of the features of uh, law, as I said, consistency, predictability, the defining features of rule of law. Uh, in this, because there, there's no organized movement, there's no structure around it. So it again depends a lot, as I as we discussed, okay, who's the chief justice, who are the cases, who are the people who are hearing cases, and what sort of moods they are in. Uh, that's also, and what is also the political environment in in in, in country. So it becomes all the more erratic. Uh, very important, but one of the other things I also learned from my Mossad uh, public interest litigation, he was like, never rely on, uh, don't get, focus too much on timings and judges, because you cannot control this. You never know if you want to do this. You cannot rely on individuals. You don't know that they are here. They benches guess get uh, like get changed. They retired or new regime. Your philosophy comes about. Uh, because the judiciary have also policies, there's law and there's policy. I was uh, in one of my public interest litigations, a judge have really refused to give a relief, uh, interim relief. And I asked, you know, under the law, I'm entitled to so and so forth. It's like, this is not our po current policy. I'm like, what do you mean, this is not policy? I'm talking about law. It's like, no, this is not our policy. So the policies also change and judiciary they also work under policies considering who is the chief justice. So for immediate strategic purposes, she's right. But in the longer run, uh, strengthen the organizing uh, organization around the public interest mitigations and don't rely too much perhaps on timing well. Uh, 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 it's a fear of doing damage when you're dealing with people and their rights and you can actively be doing something that actually puts an end to their rights for them. I think that's a huge responsibility to carry as uh, somebody who is involved in any form of litigation. Um, and when you know that the environment is such that in all probability, it could go south. So I think it, it just becomes, you know, an issue of, the, I agree with you that it should not be filtering down in everything, but however, depending on what, what the nature of your work is, I think it's important. Thank you both. Same question for you, Ms. Epe and Ms. Lopez, if either of you would like to go first. Yes, I would, um, uh, I found those, those responses really interesting. In, in the family law context, there are really two areas that I think are incredibly important. One is realizing that um, many of these cases, the fact pattern has to be established at the, at the lowest court level, or you can't change it going forward. And so sometimes we will have a discussion in which I'll say, this is what we, you know, we are only going to get one shot at this. So it's got to be put together in a way that has all of the evidence and it's got to be the right case. The other timing issue is um, the, considering the possibility of the enforcement of a foreign order involving a Pakistani national. There have been a number of cases where a, a U.S. court in a case that it can be coordinated in parallel litigation could give rise to, for example, writ practice that's available in Pakistan but not in the United States to advance a broader concept. And, and that would be, I mean, some of the groundwork for the Hague Convention on the Civil Aspects of International Child Abduction and its acceptance in Pakistan came because of a series of cases that were brought that were not successful ultimately in enforcement, but normalized the concepts of returning a child legally and having the high court render those decisions. So that I would say that enforcement in the case particularly where there is um, uh, nationality jurisdiction and in child issues where we talk about ordinary residents, those cases um, and enforcement of foreign judgments provide an additional timing opportunity.
I would add lastly, <clears throat> I also found the comments by our panelists and colleagues very compelling as it relates to empowerment. And what I've really loved about the report that you all have put together is it highlights the foundational legal inequities, but also the inequities in application. And I think that's when strategic litigation should be paused. When we're meeting with a client and the client is saying, here are my priorities, safety, here are my priorities, uh, paying my rent, you know, all of these other things that the client is saying, I've come to this space feeling disempowered in some element of my life. And us as the attorneys are looking at all the legal issues and all of this sort of strategy around it. But the human in front of us is saying, great, I don't really care about the court. At this point, what I want is um, to be able to get my kids to safety or, or something. So to me, I think strategic litigation is always in the back of our mind when we're thinking this case is going to come forward at some point and I'm going to be ready to make human rights arguments, to make arguments about equality and equity and how that's manifest in the facts of this case. But everything is on hold until the client says, this is my ship and we're starting. And I think um, in family law particularly, certainly the gender divide is something we have to keep talking about when we're thinking about strategic litigation. It's not enough to argue the law should mandate quality, the law should mandate equity. And the way in which the law actually manifests in people's lives is really, I think, the stage we're at you know, um, in terms of planning our strategic litigation in order to really represent women and all, all persons of identities that have been marginalized. Again, the, the work that you all are doing around just dismantling law that is on its face, um, unequal, is so important. It's such a foundation. But then again, the, the devil's in the details, as they say, of even if we get the law there, which many of the laws in the U.S., I would say, on their face are really um, about equality. But in application, we're hearing from our clients and our grassroots organizations about how the law is falling short. So um, empowerment, I would say, would be the, the time to to pause our, our strategic litigation goals. Thank you. Thank you all. This has been a very fruitful discussion.